<laughs> Dan, thank you so much for being here. I wanted to start for anyone who doesn't know you or your work, who are you, what do you do? What do you care about? Just give a like a quick introduction. Thanks, Alexa. It's so lovely to be able to share some of these ideas with you because I think that our backgrounds are kind of similar. So I started out in the graphic design world a long, long time ago. And what I've done over my career is realize that a lot of the things that I learned in being a designer early on in my life have had an impact well beyond the notion of what a designer typically does. So what I've done is I ended up over my career becoming more a management consultant using the skills that I'd learned as a designer to help people in business, usually pretty senior leaders, be more clear about their own thinking from the perspective of their business vision, their business strategy, how they're operating their organization, and make that more clear and something that's easier for them to communicate by using basic drawing. Sort of the, to my mind, the fundamental skill of someone who's a designer of any sort is the ability to at least sort of roughly sketch out your idea. I've written a series of books on this topic. My first one, Alexa, came out 12 years ago. It was called The Back of the Napkin, and it allowed me to quit my job. The book was successful enough to where I was able to quit my day job as an art director and design director in a studio here in San Francisco and shift into what I really wanted to do, which was help other people understand how design can help clarify life. And my most recent book, which will come out next week, is kind of the culmination of all that. It's called The Pop-Up Pitch. And, and you can kind of see it's a workshop in a book. It's the two-hour creative sprint to the most per, uh, persuasive presentation of your life, which combines both the idea of using visuals and combining them with telling a story and aimed at helping all kinds of people, not just designers, but all business people understand that we all have a story to tell. And if we can tell it in a really simple way, whether it's a story about ourselves or the product we're working on or the thing, frankly, that we want to sell or persuade, we can do it really, really effectively through a simple visual story. 12 years ago, that's when the first book came out. That's incredible. Yep. I, when I think of visual storytelling, I do think of Dan Rome now, but why do you care about any of this? Why does it matter? Oh yeah. Well, gosh, because uh, life as, as a kid, I loved to draw and I found and, and, and that's true of all kids. And anybody who's watching this ever, you'll remember when we were little, we drew because before we learned how to read and write, that was kind of our sole method of communicating our idea, capturing it and sharing it as we drew a little house and a son and a car and a dog and whatever it is that we drew. And then for most people somewhere around, I don't know, second grade, third grade, we drew a picture of a dog or something and a teacher or a friend or family member said, what is that a drawing of? And we said, oh, it's a dog. And they said, God, that doesn't look anything like a dog. And we're like, oh, and then we stopped drawing. Well, I wasn't that person. I just kept going. And I have realized over the years that by virtue of being the weirdo who kept drawing, even in meeting rooms where nobody else had done anything like drawing for years and years, that it gave me a special way of looking at what people were talking about. And when I would go to the whiteboard, like what I even have behind me, and draw out the ideas that people were talking about, Alexa, everything changed. All the political crap that might be in the, in the meeting would drop away. The weird angst around who, who owns the meeting and who owns the idea drop away. Because the moment you'd be the one who draw it out really goes straight into like true human thinking. Oh, I see what you're talking about. No, that's not what I meant. It, I meant it more like this. Well, if we change that, and Alexa, the thing that I would say that I care about it so much is when you get a bunch of people who would normally not be super effective in communicating with each other, when they would pick up the pen and go to the whiteboard and start saying, no, it's, it's not about that. It's actually about this thing over here. That's why I care because it changes everything. So through your work, what have you learned about the power of images and visualizations and its effect on how we communicate? Let's put it this way, Alexa. We are all in our lives and in our work really busy doing the things that we do. And especially when we work for a company, you know, I know that you work for a really big company and I have worked with a lot of big companies in the past. And maybe a lot of the people who are going to watch this work for a big organization, or maybe they're on their own working for a small organization. The most important part to me of all that we do is being able to understand it ourselves so that we can share it with someone else. And if you think about user experience design, I mean, the whole notion of saying, there's going to be an app on this little device. And what I want is someone who's using that app 
to be able to intuitively understand how you go from beginning to end, you know, to get the result that you want. It's all about communication to me. And sometimes the communication is explicit, meaning, hey, Alexa, let's have a meeting during which I'm going to show you a presentation or a PowerPoint and take you through like the five things that I think. That's like the explicit form. But what about the more kind of implicit or hidden form of communication, which is I'm going to make an application or I'm going to make a product. And without you, the user, even knowing that you're doing it, the product will communicate with you so clearly that you will understand instinctively how to use it. So that communication piece is where visuals to me are always at home because humans, all of us are so incredibly profoundly visual for the 97 plus percent of the world's population that is blessed with the gift of sight. Yes, I understand that there are people who see differently or don't see at all. But for most of us who do, the data is pretty incredible for the average human adult on the planet, if you think about the entire processing capacity of our brain, probably it's estimated more than half of the entire processing ability of our brain that we have is dedicated to helping us process vision. More of the human brain is dedicated to processing vision than any other thing that we do by a vast amount, more than language, more than logic, more than math, more than memory, just the sheer crazy complicated process of our eyes and our brain turning light light reflecting off of stuff that's in the world in front of us into our brain and turning that into images that refresh thousands of times a second. I mean, it's an enormous task. And what I'm hoping to do is help people communicate their idea by understanding how people see. That's the impact. Does, does that help answer the, the question? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think when we think about the work of a designer, it often is bringing it back to the people we are designing the products for. So what better way to tell that story than to help your audience visualize it? Oh, absolutely. Who are some of your favorite visual storytellers and why? Wow. Okay. So my favorite all-time, all-time favorite visual storyteller and it's unfortunate because I know that she's gotten herself in a little bit sideways with a lot of people these days. It's still J.K. Rowling and, and Harry Potter. And I think it's really sad that kind of in the social media sphere, things have gotten a little awry because I do believe that she is one of the greatest storytellers of our generation. And what very few people know about J.K., but you can do the research and it's awesome, is that she actually began to create all of her stories, all the Harry Potter stories the things that she wrote under a pseudonym, et cetera, by drawing them out. If you were to look at JK's drawings, and many of them are now available online, you would, you would not say those were great drawings. But to me, her capacity to tell a story that hits on so many emotional levels and to recognize that the complexity and the elaboration of her stories was enabled because she drew them first, to me is just... <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> no, it, it, it seriously is. I encourage anyone who grew up with Harry Potter or any of her work. Yeah, there's some upset, what, what have you. But to, in my mind, it doesn't diminish the quality of the work or how she did it. It's really worth going and looking at visual storytelling in the best possible sense is, is still her work, I, I think, in, in memory. That's incredible. I never knew that about J.K. Rowling. She drew everything. Another one, if I may, because I love this topic so much, Alexa, if I can go just for a moment. For anybody who's ever read The Lord of the Rings or any of J.R.R. Tolkien's books, same thing. He drew the maps. He drew The Hobbit. He drew everything. And it's a really crazy story because the same thing happened with J.K. when she went to have her books published. Uh, when she met the publishers, same with J.R.R. Tolkien, a generation before her, the publishers said, we don't want these drawings because we, Britain, are a very literary culture and we wouldn't want to have these drawings in books because drawings are considered child's work and um, drawings are not serious and you are a, a great literary star. And so we want the, the books to be written with words only. And those authors, and there are many of them, Roald Dahl, was the same uh, for anybody who's familiar with Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, who wrote The Little Prince. He drew his books before. So many of the people who became great literary stars drew. And it's been this crazy, really messed up notion about what is serious literature, that it would not include visuals, which to me is completely insane, totally, totally insane. Because if you look now at the rise of graphic novels, 
if you look at how we actually communicate now, whatever your digital tools are, whether it's Insta or Facebook, whatever, whatever you love as a way to share visually around the world, it's insane that there was a time not very long ago where people in the literary world would actually pull the visuals out of the story to say, no, 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 pure thinking is just visual, which is totally hogwash. Anyway, that's my soapbox. I'm off it now. That's so interesting. Do you have any insight into why that, why that was? Like what happened? What happened to, the, to that generation where they thought that drawing was just for, for children's books? Well, okay. If you want to go back in history, we have to <laughs> blame, blame the Brits. So the educational system that most of us grew up with in the last multiple generations, if you grew up in the United States, if you grew up in any place where English is a primary language, that, that was at one time a colony of Great Britain. So that would be the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, South Africa. I mean, so many countries around the world where the British influence in education was what really set up the educational system. The British educational system, as we largely know it and inherited it even up to today, was developed during the Industrial Revolution, say 150 to 160 years ago. And the intent of that educational system was by design to take people who had grown up in the rural fields of England and get them capable of working in a factory. So the industrial revolution where steam power comes in, where big iron, casting iron, moving into mechanical operation systems becomes a big deal. What you see is a, is a giant migration of people from rural communities into industrial cities. And the education system was set up to basically turn people into factory cogs. Now, education is beautiful and it's brilliant and without it, we would be utterly bereft, but we have to recognize that the system was in many ways designed to identify who are the people among us who are the most verbal Because those are the people who are smart, because those are the people who are going to become the leaders in the factory. And the rest of us who may be less verbal are going to end up being the people who are going to throw the switches and pull the levers. And so the system, the the British educational system in many ways was largely set up to make a distinction between if you can talk real good, you're going to go into leadership. And if you can't talk good, you're going to go into being a worker. And we inherited a lot of that. And along the way, and I found this insane, Alexa, but as I was doing research, if you go back to look in, say, classic, I don't know, late 19th century Britain, engineering education, to get a degree in engineering, like the designing of systems and locomotives and bridges, when you tested to get your engineering degree, you were not allowed to wave your hands or draw a picture. You had to describe with words how you would build a bridge. Can you think of anything more insane on earth when the easiest thing in the world is to say, okay, how do I build a bridge? Well, there's a ravine. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build an, you know, an arched bridge like this. And my forces are going to be such, you know, it wants to be a drawing that you had to describe how you do that with using only words. That's where in particular in the British English educational system, to this day, there remains a disdain, almost a fear for the power of the visual mind, as if it's not as pure as the verbal mind, which is patently insane. (laughs) Thank you for sharing that. I think it gives us a lot to think about. I want to switch gears. You wrote a book recently. Like you just said at the beginning, it's going to be really soon. Mm -hmm. It's called The Pop-Up Pitch. Why did the world need this book at this point in time? Wow. Yes. Okay, Alexa. So the world needs this book at this time because what the core of this book is, it is to help you learn to tell your very best story very, very fast. I think I mentioned earlier that I specifically set up the book as if it was a two-hour workshop, as if you and I had a chance to sit in a room with a whiteboard between us. And in two hours, what I could do is dump everything that's in my mind about storytelling and what I've learned and what I've learned from others and just share it with you in a way where you could begin to tell a very, very good story very, very quickly. So the reason why this book is needed right now is there are more presentations being given by more people about more stuff more frequently and with more distraction than ever in history. And yet, our individual need to be able to clearly tell our story in a way that's differentiated and stands out and helps persuade people is also greater than it's ever been. And I thought, 
just if I can tell this in the form of kind of an analogy, if someone works in the financial office of a company, they're a financial controller or an analyst, and the CFO comes along and says, hey, can you run me a profit and loss statement for the last two quarters? Because I want to see our numbers. That person goes in to the bookkeeping system and there's a template for how to run a PL, a profit and loss statement. And they don't make up the template. They just go into the template, they put the right parameters and outcomes the story. That's like one analogy. The other one would be if you're applying for a job and you need to put together a new CV or a new resume, you don't go and create the template for a resume. I mean, we have templates already. There's a few of them and you just pick the right one and fill it in. But here's what's crazy to me, Alexa, is that the thing that most of us need to spend most of the time doing now is making a presentation, which in a way should be about telling the story of my idea, but none of us have templates for telling a story. So why is it that the most common task in, in business, which is to tell a story, has no templates, or at least not any that are unif agreed upon or easy to use? So what I did is I said, let's take this classic story and let's just build a template around it so that if you have a presentation next week or even tomorrow, and you don't want to just give another friggin' boring PowerPoint that nobody understands, but you actually want to tell a story that's fun and engaging and persuasive, that here's a template by which you can do it. And literally you just fill in the blanks. And that's what's in the, that's, that's the purpose of the book to make telling the best story of your life, easy, fun, and super memorable and highly templated. Incredible. As a designer, I create a lot of presentations for my work and having a template to be able to like plug into would be super, super useful. I know that for uh, the pop-up pitch, there are these like ingredients to create the most persuas persuasive presentation. So what are those exactly? Can I show them to you? Yes. Because I called it the pop-up pitch for two reasons. One was, if you think about like a pop-up restaurant or a pop-up store, the analogy would be, let's say, Alexa, that you decided to open up a new, I don't know, Mexican food restaurant in San Diego. Like you were a real chef and you had a real great idea for this like new type of, let's call it not real Mexican food, but a new type of burrito, like a, a very special sushi burrito. What if we did um, a very special matcha company? Or matcha business. Ooh, you like matcha. Okay. So here's the thing. You have two options. You could go hire a bunch of people, go find a building, buy a new kitchen, train everybody up, you know, get the whole thing ready to go, have an entire marketing campaign, and then launch your new matcha cafe. That would be cool, but that's a gigantic risk. And it's going to take months and hundreds of thousands of dollars of effort for something you haven't even tested yet. So on the other hand, what if you did the pop-up version of your matcha stand and you did an MVP? a minimum viable test product. And you, you know would put up like basically a fancy lemonade stand and put it in a place where people come by. You do the pop-up restaurant and they're incredibly successful because you're able to test your product and build your initial market and your initial enthusiasts quickly and, and effectively and kind of cheaply. So I thought, well, look, why do we all spend weeks and weeks, this giant capital investment in this PowerPoint? What would happen if we just did the same thing and made a pitch that was like a pop-up, like something that we could create in an hour or two and share with someone in about seven minutes and then let them tell us terrible idea, beautiful idea, or best idea I've ever had. You know, how much money can I give you to like go ahead with this? So that's why I call it the pop-up pitch because the idea is do it like a pop-up. And the second one is... As a kid, I always loved pop-ups. So I want to be clear, in the book itself, you don't get what I'm about to show you. This is a special thing that I made. But to answer your question, what are the tools that are in the book? The first tool, there are two of them. The first one, I made the pop-up. The yeah. first one is what I call the visual decoder. And this is where you go, take your idea and draw your pictures. And then after you've drawn the pictures, you go into toolkit number two which is what I actually call the 10 page pitch. And these are the 10 slides from title all the way to end that are the 10 slides that you need to fill in to create this beautifully templated storyline that basically allows you to talk about your matcha as if you were George Lucas talking about getting, you know, Luke Skywalker to use the force. Like the same passion that comes through in these great movies is how you're going to tell your story about your matcha. And it works. It, it just works. Why do you think it's important that people are able to create these compelling presentations in less than two hours? <laughs> Who has enough time to invest in this giant PowerPoint thing right now? When what 
we're really in, I think, Alexa, is we are, most of us that are in design, the business we're really in is in the business of ideas. I have an idea for what might be a better product, or I have an idea for what I think might be a better workflow, or I have an idea for what might be a better story to tell. Why am I going to spend weeks and weeks going into every detail before I've even tested it out at the high level? So imagine if you could conceive of your entire story and build it, your presentation in less than two hours. I mean, you could do it in the morning and then this afternoon you could share it with your team. And then tomorrow morning you could share it with, you know, your manager or your boss. And most likely because the story is a good one, they'll say, that's a pretty good idea. Go ahead and spend more time on it. If we can't do it in two hours, in my mind, then we probably are not working on the right idea. Can you bring out the pop-up book again? Yeah. 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 I think it's like the 10 page like pitch. 10, this one 10 steps. Yeah. The 10 so, steps. So great. I was lucky enough to be able to read your book um, already. So thank you for sending that over. I was wondering of the 10 step framework, which step do you think tends to be the most challenging for people and why? Oh yeah. I can tell you exactly which one it is. Think about the 10 steps here. I'll actually show it to you in, in kind of a linear format. So when we talk about the 10 step story, it actually looks like this, if you were to draw it out. So we start over here and this, and the up and down indicates sort of the level of positivity in the story. And we start sort of at neutral. We just say, here's what we're going to talk about and everything's fine. And then, oops, there's a problem. But after the problem, well, I have hope, what I'm going to try to achieve at the end of hope, but guess what? I'm not going to get my hope because boom, I totally pulled the rug out from under you. And now I'm going to spend the rest of the story, like coming back up to an even better position than where I started. So in the design world, we have a tendency to think that the most important thing is the design or the product that we're working on. We are all very product specific, product centric. Now that's what we're paid to do. And of course that's correct. So if your job is to build one of these, then build one of those. But the thing that makes this valuable isn't what it is, it's what it does. And more in particular, it's what it enables its owner to do. So the reason why I think, so the hardest question for people in the 10 page pitch is to say, don't tell me about the features that you're bringing to the solution. I don't care. All I care about is what is the problem that your thing is going to solve and how easy is it going to be for me to use to solve that problem? I don't care how fast it is. I don't care how many buttons it has. And this is provable. This is the sort of the limitation of, of what this is the trick and kind of the paradox of being a product designer is you're spending your life in the design of the product when in the end, the product is inconsequential. It's what the product does that is all that matters. So that's where as the designer, you are threading a really interesting needle because you're putting your life into, in many cases, the beauty of the workflow or in many cases, say the beauty of the screen, the elegance of the screen, those are all in the service of what does it enable the user to do. And so the trick in the 10 page pitch is at the center, right at the inflection point in the absolute middle of the story. And here's where I'm gonna answer your question, Alexa. It's right here, believe it or not, the most important part is what happens when we go from life is over and we're never gonna solve this problem to wait, we can. And the way we're going to do it is with this particular product or solution. When you start to build your 10 page pitch, your pop-up pitch at the beginning, know what product or solution it is you want to persuade someone to support or to buy, but don't start your story telling me about it because I don't care. I will meet your product halfway through the story because you're going to spend the first half of the story explaining to me the world as beautiful as it is today and what is about to go really bad in the world as you know it today and how awful it's going to feel when the things that you have used in the past are no longer available. But now I have a solution and the solution is the thing that I've been working on. And then you get to spend the last half telling us how mag magnificently it solves that problem. If we kind of weave together almost everything we've talked about so far, the 10 page pitch, which I'm recommending as a way for you to quickly unpack and tell your story, it's based on the hero's journey, which comes from, you know, a deep Joseph Campbell's deep analysis of myths throughout all of human history and the common monomyth story that we tend to tell. And then I've amped it up with 
some more thoughts from user experience design, some more thoughts from behavioral economics, and some good old classic American sales stuff, like how do you actually positively persuade someone with an abundant mindset to do something? It's all about being on the positive side. But guess what? It is exactly the same storyline back to JK. The hero, Harry Potter is the hero's journey. Star Wars is the hero's journey. Marvel Comic Universe, every one of those stories is the hero's journey. The Hunger Games, you know, Katniss, she's the same as Luke. It's the same, we're the same character over and over and over again. What we want to do in making our presentation about our software or our solution is find the user and say to the user, you're Luke or you're Katniss. And what I'm giving you is the force. Mm -hmm. Or if you're Harry I'm or Hermione, I'm giving you the magic. I'm giving you the wand. That's You already have it in you. I'm just giving you the thing that's going to enable your inherent ability to be a genius and make it even a little easier and faster. It's inspiring. Yeah. And it's all the same. It's it's all the same story. We are so complicated as humans, but we're really not at the same time. <laughs> so what's really great about visual storytelling is how it can apply to our to our day-to-day -day design work. But there's also a lot of visual storytelling that can make a positive impact on your life and your career. So I wanted to just talk a little bit more about with you with that. I know you prepared some slides as well to sort of walk us through that. I then... did. Could we maybe actually do a little visual storytelling on screen? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. So Alexa, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to move a couple of things around. I'm going to share. So let's take a moment. Can I just kind of go through this, Alexa, and we'll just talk about it a little bit? Because there's a lot of words on the screen here. So visual, we've talked about a lot, and storytelling. And what I really want to focus on, we've talked a lot about design. And if we got really big for a moment, let's talk about design with a big D, like design with a super capital D, not necessarily UX design or graphic design or product design, but design as it was originally intended to be, this idea of intentionally creating tools and approaches that amplify what we're already good at. So um, in the design of our life. So the first, there's kind of five ideas here, and I don't know if we need to go over all of them, but one of them was, I think in its own way that design really is life. Because if you think about your life and career as a designer, it's really head turning and cool when you realize that the very tools and design skills you've been taught, you can bring them to your own life. I mean, if, if our job is a UX designer or a UI designer, and we know that there's a very complicated problem that someone faces and they're looking at it very sadly, what we wanna do is give them a process to go through a kind of a flow you know, whatever that is, that's going to make them feel good about it. So we know these tools, we know how to understand the problem, we know how to understand the need of the user, we know how to go through the, the design practice informed through, again, agile and testing and frequent iteration. Well, what would happen if we brought that whole process to just looking at our own life? <laughs> looking back, where have I been? Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I just want to, I want to say too, when I started learning about design for the first time at art school back in undergrad and college, I don't remember the first moment I, I had this thought, but I, I felt like I was able to solve the problems in my life a lot more clearly, a lot more intentionally. And mm -hmm. it, I couldn't separate the idea of like designing for work or how I would design for work separately for, from how I was designing for the problems I was like approaching in my life. And everything just got a lot more clear and a lot more a lot better, quite frankly. Can you, at the degree of, you know, telling us what you want to tell us, but can you give us an example? Let me see if I can try to pull a specific example. I know from conversations we've had that you went through a lot of decisions about deciding what kind of design career you wanted to have. Yes. Yeah. I was thinking career. I was thinking we could potentially talk career. Okay. So do, do, do you want to map something out? Could we try it? Like using some basic sketching to just map out a decision that you had to make. We could do it right here if you wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. So we're going to start here with, this is Alexa a long time ago. So give us an age. Where do we want to start this story out? If we're starting it out from when I really thought about like design, designing your life, right? Like I think that would actually probably start us at in college, probably in San Francisco, which is where I went to art school. Mm -hmm. And yeah, let's, let's start me there. Okay. So you're kind of bopping along, going to art school. 
-hmm. Maybe certain with what you want to do, maybe uncertain about what you want to do. And what might be an inflection point? Give us early on in your college career, what was something that happened that was really great that early on in school was like, yeah, this is the right thing for me to do? Well, so prior to coming to college in San Francisco, I was going to college at a state school in Wisconsin, which is where Mm -hmm. I grew up. And I originally went there to play college basketball, essentially. Okay. Yeah. And I, I did that. And uh, I also ended up studying graphic design there because I, 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 I don't think I really knew what it was back then, but at least it was more of like a hands-on sort of mm-hmm. discipline. And I liked my art school, art, my art classes in high school. So I thought that this made sense, but that all to say, I went there to really play basketball mm-hmm. and I found myself really, really unhappy after two years, both with how basketball was going, but also just kind of the location where that college was and not feeling like, uh, I don't know. I just didn't feel energized or motivated. That's kind of like the feeling I remember back then. So what I remember is I wanted to hit a big red button and just reset start. And that ended up landing me in college in San Francisco, going to art school. I decided to still study graphic design, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do with that degree still. Like I remember going to, to college there and taking my classes and I loved it. I was having a better experience, but I still didn't know what is, what it is that I wanted to do. Right. And I wouldn't say I was stressed out about that necessarily. I had, I was like in school for about, um, just over two years at that point. So I had some time left before graduating, but I remember being like, like, I don't know. (laughs) And then I took an intro into interaction design course Mm -hmm. at at my college. And it was kind of like lightning struck. I was just, it was so energizing taking that class. I would take that class. It was in the evening at, it was like a whole like 11 hour day. I would get home around like 11 PM maybe. And I would keep working. Like I would keep working on the work in that class. And it was just like, all right, this is what I'm supposed to do. (laughs) Yeah. So from there, yeah, it was just like super freaking energy. You couldn't stop. That was like, you were in flow, flow plus. Yes. Yes, exactly. So I'd say this part of my, my, my life was, I was on a high for sure. I was like, I want to try to get internships for the summer to, um, you know, keep developing my skills in this area while I'm still in school. Um, and it ultimately ended, land, ended up landing me a full-time position at a company right after college. Okay. Yeah. And that company was Yelp. So I went and worked there full-time for two years. I had a really positive experience working there as an intern and, uh, and I was, I felt super lucky to be able to go back and work there full-time. And then I worked there for about two and a half years and I, I, th- I think I felt like I was not growing anymore. Mm-hmm. There weren't growth opportunities. And so another inflection point, I was feeling a little bit low. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to make a change to try my best to try and find another opportunity and be intentional about it that mm-hmm. matched the areas of growth that I was looking for. Mm-hmm. What I felt like I wasn't uh, getting at that job. And so I wrote the, I actually wrote those down. I wrote like what I was looking for my next job. So I could really like try to even, you know, interview the companies that I was trying to apply for and work at and try to give them that. And I had a really hard time interviewing after this role. Mm -hmm. I was receiving a lot of rejection. It was really tough. I hadn't, I hadn't felt that low about my career probably since moving to San Francisco (laughs) at that time. So it was quite low. Yeah. That's. I persevered through. I ended up talking to a lot of people, getting a lot of feedback and perspective. And I ended up landing my job at Sundesk. And that was definitely a high. I, at Sundesk, I've been lucky enough to be able to take on various roles on different teams. I I feel like the company supports designers and their career growth really well. Uh, I switched into design ops. Now I'm back in product design. I've been here for almost five years and it's, yeah, I feel like, I feel really good about, yeah, where I'm currently at right now. It's pretty, yeah, things are going great. (laughs) Well, look at what we just drew. What do you know? It's exactly the 10 page pitch right here. Mm -hmm. So things started out over here. Here, let me pick a different color just so we can kind of follow along. I'll pick maybe this blue here. So it's kind of like we begin here. Things are okay, but basketball doesn't go very well. So you make a change. Great. Things are getting awesome. And then clunk Mm -hmm. comes down a little bit, goes up. And then here's the big clunk. And what I'm going to play back to you, Alexa, is it's Mm -hmm. this moment where things are pretty, but you didn't give up. And if you think about what happened, what 
might you attribute, whatever it could be, to what you heard in your head or what you did or what response you got? Because you said interviews were going badly. You weren't sure what you wanted to do. You'd been in a great position, but now you're not. What enabled this to happen? What was the magic, maybe the wrong word, but what was the turn where it was going to be okay? Yeah. It was honestly talking to other people yeah. and asking for feedback. And mm-hmm. I had to get really, it wasn't just asking for feedback on my portfolio. It was being really specific and intentional about what I wasn't, what wasn't working about like my interview, like the interviews that I was mm-hmm. um, participating in. That's what I remember was, was what really turned it around. I remember one specific conversation with a woman who, you know, I'm not even really in touch with now. I'm, you know, we met up, I, it was through some sort of coaching or mentorship swap, like kind of one-off thing. And she had a really big impact on my life in my career. And, and, um, and yeah, it made a really big difference. Well, here, you just said the magic thing, because what it really comes down to is many of us. And this is true of all of the hero's journey stories, all of these life stories, is we think that we have to do it on our own. Mm -hmm. And that inflection point where you go from basically death to not, more often than not, is recognizing that that is the moment you need to ask for help. And you're asking from any number of sources. And again, it's it's in, in the classic sense, it could be a voice in the universe. It's the idea that you're not alone. Yeah. And that we often, when at that pit of despair, believe we are alone. And it's the reaching out to someone else, whether it's a voice in our head or in your particular case, the, you know, asking for friends, this is not working. Can you help me? I, I can't do it alone. And people will come rallying. And that's the moment where you realize, hell yeah, I can do this. It's where like a lot of the most important lessons I think come from too. You really mm-hmm. have to go to that dark place sometimes to be able to like learn them. But once you you have it, it's so energizing and fulfilling. Well, I'm going to add, throw in one more, and maybe this is a great way to conclude this, is that what we just did, Alexa, is we went through and with your story, you told it as a story and we mapped it out. And it's exactly the same storyline that naturally we tell a story and it is that same storyline that is the core of this whole 10 page pitch. Yeah. Yeah. It is magic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. This it's it's such a pleasure talking with you about visual storytelling. If people want to learn more about you and your work, maybe buy the pop-up pitch, where do they go online to find you? Yeah, it's easy. Just go to my website. It's simple. It's danrome.com, D-A-N-R-O-A-M.com. And all of the tools, Alexa, that we've been talking about, the template for the 10-page pitch, even the template for how to draw the simple pictures that are going to populate that story, I made all those templates available for free, and they're on the website. So just go to danrome.com, scroll about halfway down the page, and you'll see all the templates that are the core of the book. They're available uh, for free for anybody who wants to download them and then um, take a look. I'm easy to find online. Yeah. And I'll include some links in the description below to this YouTube video also. On Instagram, I've just started a new hashtag for anybody who's interested. It's it's hashtag the pop-up pitch. And I just started posting to that today. So if anybody wants to follow along, I'm serious, Alexa, if anybody's listening to this and wants to share a visual view of your story, whether it's your life story or your product story or your design story, uh, if you just put it on Insta and um, put the hashtag the pop-up pitch, I will link to all of them and I want to collect as many of those stories as we possibly can. That's incredible. I was going to also say, if anyone wants to leave a comment uh, and comment down below, let us know if you try this out, post it on Instagram, add the hashtag. I'm going to be following along that as well. I'd love to see those. I'm yeah. going to, um, I'm going to do it as well. So you've heard it here. You'll be able to see mine in there. <laughs> Thanks Alexa. Uh, yeah. Upon uploading this video, I'll make sure it's up. So good to see you as always. And yeah, we'll do more of this soon. Take I'll care. Bye. Bye.